Il passe au ouais Super bel artiste Super oh, Encore un but sensationnel Hello everybody and welcome to Uniform the Handball Hour. We're back for another episode. It's myself and Chris O'Reilly today. Alex will be still probably in bed at this stage, or what, whatever time it is now in the US. But we're here to bring you some, a kind of a catch up to what's been going on at the Women's World Championship. Chris, I think probably for the first time ever, we can be a little bit proud of some of the predictions we made. We don't always get them right, but we did hit a few nails on the head this time around, didn't we? Yeah, I think so. And that's uh, what, mostly what this podcast is going to be about. <laughs> <laughs> so before we move on to the, the quarterfinal previews in the next one. Yeah, first of all, Japan and Alex uh, deserving a bit of credit for that. I think he predicted them to beat Romania, but they went one better or maybe five better and beat Denmark on their home patch in the, the first game of the main round. Then went on to lose against Romania, just to really like compound the unpredictable nature of this Japanese team, which has been really enjoyable to watch. Uh, but what a game that was. I think that that's probably the game that has um, had the most people in the handball world watching, just out of pure interest as it un- unfolded. Um, even I was commentating on a game in Gothenburg, which is pure like a pure disaster with Sweden were hammering uh, Cameroon and with 12 minutes left I, I was said look if you're watching this live you may as well go over and watch the game that's <laughs> happening in earning <laughs> I've never said that before probably never say it again but uh, <clears throat> I could see the live score on my screen uh, over in earning I was like God, this is this could be massive and it turned out to be Japan were I mean, just all over them, weren't they, for certain parts of the match? And they were up by three at the end. And it was only kind of through a bit of Danish resolve that they had pulled it back. And then to win, if you didn't, obviously, if you didn't see it, if you had been living under a rock, winning with a, an in flight goal, which uh, really definitely uh, stung for a lot of the Danish fans. And you know it's stung because you see the amount of traction it gets on Twitter with everyone, oh, yeah. everyone pointing out how she may have landed slightly inside. But I think now in modern handball, if you're not landed inside from a wing shot, you're not really a winger, are you? Like yeah, you exactly, know, yeah. I mean, quite ironic. Quite ironic coming from the uh, the home of the Gog Five Step that uh, <laughs> they're complaining <laughs> about these technicalities, um, which is maybe something we'll talk about in, uh, in another pod. But like the referees have had some directives about clamping down on on traveling and landing inside, which is really like grinding my gears. But we don't have time for that uh, <laughs> right now. We can save that maybe for later, but. Uh, uh, another kind of fun thing. I, I'm not sure if it's the case in all Scandinavian countries, but in uh, in Sweden, an in-flight goal is called uh, Japan. So a Japan. Ah. And so the fact that Japan won with, with the Japan, Japan <laughs> at the end <laughs> that's good. Uh, was really tickling all of the the people over in Gothenburg. Anyway, that's for sure. Yeah, that's good. Uh, so yeah, great win for them. Just a pity, like you know, they'll look back at this championship, or we'll look back in this championship and see the. Like the narrow losses they've suffered to Germany, Poland, and Romania, and if they just managed to, you know, turn one of those around, how different uh, the final day in Herning would be here in the main round, but also how different their championship uh, could have been. It'll be one where, um, you know, uh, they probably it's not going to be a disaster for them that they haven't made it through to the quarterfinals. They've definitely done themselves proud and. Uh, you know, they're they're a team to watch out for now in the Olympics next year. That that's for sure. They've really propelled themselves these last two championships uh, to being a, a top twelve team in the world, and I think they've proven that. Um, but Denmark, they they bounce back pretty well, and now it's a big a big test for them and their final game against Germany, which uh, you know is, is happening today. So I will ask you this though: like whatever happens with uh, Germany and Denmark later. Uh, I think probably Denmark up to that point looked fairly rock solid. And I think the teams would look at that going, look, if we can keep it close against Denmark, they kind of wilted for a lot of the parts in the second half. And that maybe, I mean, who knows what happens in the Germany game later, but the definitely teams coming up against Denmark will think, okay, they are beatable. We'll just have to take a bit of Japan's blueprint. Whether teams can emulate what Japan do, it's another question. But um, 
yeah, maybe the shine maybe gone off of Denmark a little bit. Yeah, also the first game of the championship against uh, Serbia where they had a, a very slow start and had to, I think they went to the 6-1 run in the last 12 minutes to win that game by uh, by four or five. So yeah, they, they've they been far from perfect. But um, yeah, I think this Germany game will, will tell a lot in that regard. But I think you're right, German, or Denmark are not uh, by any means, uh, you know, uh, clear front runner here and uh, I think that's what we're seeing from a lot of the teams once they're put up again against a real challenge they're uh, they're showing a little bit of nerves maybe that's the format of the competition not giving these big teams enough challenges along the way but uh, we we saw it at the beginning for France against Angola uh, Norway against France and uh, I will speak about that one a little bit as well but uh, yeah the Denmark out there even on home soil could be beaten. Yeah, I mean, also Germany must be must be fairly happy with their their tournament so far. I mean, they can't they couldn't really do much better. I mean, five out of five. I listened into our old friend of the podcast, Asher Stats podcast, because he had some some journalists on from Eurosport who were a lot closer to the German team, and they were saying that they've never kind of or they can't remember a, an atmosphere in the German team like this. And you, I think you do kind of see it uh, on the court that there is a certain level of confidence that they are playing with. And I suppose, unlike. Um, Unlike Denmark, they seem to have uh, kind of responded well in those kind of critical moments in games and didn't wilt. So if you uh, think back to the the last World Championship, do you remember Dem- Germany had a good run coming up and then they came in against Denmark in the very last game of the main round and they lost, was it lost by 16 goals? They absolutely wilted 32-16 or something along those lines. So they maybe have a... Oh, the memory of what it's like to be in this kind of very similar position going into this exact same game this time out. And I think if if it, if the result against Denmark is close, I think they'll they'll be fairly happy with that result. Go, and I think and maybe an outsider chance of getting to a, a semi final. Yeah, we'll see. yeah, uh, the uh, that's for sure. I think the the teams that come out of this group, Denmark and and Germany, will fancy their chances against the the teams that are coming out from uh, the group here in Gothenburg. Um, with one other prediction which uh, was scoffed at in the previous podcast where all three of us were on was my uh, my suggestion that Czech Republic uh, could actually get into the quarterfinals could do a job against Spain and Brazil uh, and that these two groups maybe aren't matching up as evenly as, as some of the others and uh, well it proved to be the point uh, Czech Republic beating Spain 30-22 uh, Marketa Yazhabkova having a championship of her life. I've seen it written online, and uh, I think that is a very accurate description. I mean, she's a fantastic player. 46 goals, leading the uh, the goal scoring charts by uh, country mile, and uh, I think she's right up at the top of the assist charts as well. So uh, Yazhabkova and uh, Bent Dahl having a laugh out there, and they lost to Brazil yesterday. Um, 30-27 but it was a game where Brazil needed to win by I think they needed to win by uh, 5 or 6 to to turn over the goal difference and uh, they went in a late run but I think uh, the Czechs basically had the job done by half time they were winning by a goal and they were able to they kind of not chill out but they were able to control the game knowing that even a 3 goal loss was never going to hurt them pretty entertaining group in the end that one actually with the, I mean, yeah. the, the Dutch finishing in top I think is clear Clearly the strongest team in there. And I think maybe, I don't did they prove a point against Spain? And maybe it's, an, it's something we can talk about in a bit. But the other yeah. three teams just below them, Czech Republic, Brazil and Spain, all finished obviously on six points with the Czechs going through with the uh, the better goal difference. Um, but the Dutch team looking good. I mean, we obviously had a few questions about them, whether they're as good as they were looking. But if you're going to take, I mean, you weren't too hot on this Spanish team coming into the tournament, and you're no. you're pretty much right about it. You know, you were pretty much you were right about it. <laughs> uh, but this Dutch <laughs> team dispatched them fairly fairly handily. I mean, they were up thirteen nine half time, and then they saw it the win twenty nine twenty one. So a very very big win um, for the Dutch team. Okay, you can always ask questions. This is the same Spanish team of yesteryear, probably not, but. Everything well, that's, put- the, that's the problem. It is the same Spanish team of yesteryear. Oh, yeah, maybe. They're, yeah, yeah. they're five years older now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. It is the same Spanish team as yesteryear. Uh, but, like, yeah, so far, every single question we've asked this Dutch team, they've they've passed it with flying colours. And they are really grown with confidence coming into the, coming into the uh, to their knockout matches now. And I think also 
some players that are like Zoe Springers, for example, who I've talked about in the past, what I want to see a bit more from, I think have played very well. Diana House here is uh, is really coming into her own. And maybe players like Lois Abing and the likes aren't as prominent as they were in the past, which is probably a good thing as well when you want to see them still in the mix, but then some of the younger players coming through. So it's a, it's a very, very interesting mix, I think, between young and old coming through here. And I think they're they're peaking. They're peaking. And it's very it's going to be great to see what happens now. Yeah, I like uh, I like the team. They've definitely grown on me as this championship has gone on. Um, you can say what you want about the group, but you can only beat what's in front of you. And they've beaten those teams in kind of a classic Dutch way. They've you know the counter attacking is fantastic. The way they find solutions uh, in that sense is really really good. And I was impressed against Spain the way that they tore them apart in that way. The the final score there of an eight goal win. Uh, I think flatters Spain even a little bit because this game was over with 15 minutes left to play. There was a 10 goal lead, uh, 22 to 12, and it just disappointed me a little bit that the you know the Spaniards coming into this game still had their fate in their hand. They just needed one point. Uh, just needed one point. They needed a point to to qualify, um, and. You expect in a game like that that it's going to be racked with nerves, it's going to be tight, it's going to be a real battle. Uh, but now Spain, you know, they they started a little bit strong, but faded by the end of the first half, and then the third quarter of the game, they um, you know lost that period by six goals. So yeah, there's really no no arguments for for Spain uh, missing out here, and a little bit like Japan, I think Brazil will look back in this with. Um, a little bit of disappointment of what could have been. You know, they were leading Spain in the preliminary round, lost it in the last couple of minutes. If they'd gotten anything from that, um, they could have gotten through. So, yeah, that's a pity that two non-European teams came so close in a way, but yet so far from uh, reaching the quarterfinals. And, uh, yeah, both of them, uh, or all quarterfinals are going to be... Uh, all European affairs in the end. But yeah, on the Dutch side, uh, very positive. And I, I look forward now to seeing them facing Norway in the quarterfinals after Norway uh, were beaten by France in a very entertaining game, I have to say. I don't know if you if you got to see much of that, but it was a kind of a an exhibition game, but with a little bit of nerves in there. Definitely a bit of spice in there, yeah. I mean, was, was it? I mean, he's Alex is not here now, but didn't Alex predict that France would beat Norway and then the Netherlands would beat? Would sorry, the Netherlands would meet Norway and beat them in the in the quarterfinals? So if that turns out to be true, I don't know. We need to buy him a birthday cake or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> a prediction cake. It would, <laughs> it would be the yeah. It would complete the the triumvirate of amazing uh, predictions pre championship. Uh, or during the championship. But yeah, that is a, a really tasty game. And uh, Alex did predict it. Uh, he's halfway there to that prediction. It was a great game, though, between uh, France and Norway. A kind of a classic battle between them, uh, where, you know, at the end, I, I think Norway weren't, like, devastated by the fact that they, they lost. And it's funny because it felt like at the end France were more uh, more inclined to to fight for that win they needed to win the game a draw would have been enough for Norway to finish top of the group because of the overall goal difference um, and it looked like they had it in the bag two minutes left they were up by one and, uh, and then all of a sudden France uh, turned it around and what I really found interesting about the game is that there were periods where both defences and goalkeepers were really on top and like shut down the uh the backcourt from the opposition but that did never really lasted forever we saw, got to see both teams uh, really let loose at different times maybe more on the France side with Estelle and Zeminko scoring some amazing goals she uh, managed six in the end and Orlan Canor with four the Norwegians maybe holding a little bit back in that regard like they did end up playing uh, Henny Rice a lot she was shut down for a lot of the game um, and so you know most of the goals came from uh, either Mor Merck or Oftedal uh, on the, the centre and the right side and also then a few uh, from the line I think there's more to come from Norway whereas we might have seen the best from France in that game. Yeah that's a little bit of how I felt coming out from it I felt like I mean while Norway weren't 
and uh, maybe devastated at the end of the game. They did seem a little bit annoyed. And I saw Steen off the dial, giving a few of them a bit of an earful at the final whistle. You can see that back when you even watched the... I, mean, I had a re- back, a watch back of the highlights of that just before I hear this. But um, yeah, it did feel like a, a total ebb and flow between defence and goalkeeper. And I think Laura Glazor's save right at the end was kind of... was literally was as, It was close as that. I think that was just a difference maker. I think if you played 10 more minutes, it could have been going the other way. So it really did... Um, it was a while it wasn't it wasn't too much at stake. It still was a very very entertaining game, and yeah, I'm interested to see now is the likes of Denmark Germany going to be as as interesting with the same amount at stake, but just fighting for that top position in the group. It's it's hard to know how the the quarterfinals will and the semifinals in particular will then shape up um, because uh, we all kind of laid out this path before the championships. Who's likely to face who? And now that's all messed up. So <laughs> we'll look at that when we know all of the four quarterfinals uh, after tonight's games. But I think it's a good time now to uh, introduce our guest for today's show. And uh, it's one hell of a guest. It's uh, the Montenegro coach, Bojana Popovic, who is an uh, Olympic Games silver medalist, uh, World Championship bronze medalist, six-time Champions League winner, and uh, one of the few... Uh, female players who has transitioned into being a, a top level coach and uh, I had a chance to speak to her yesterday at the team hotel about her constant rejuvenation of this Montenegrin team who just keep prizing and impressing us uh, how she deals with the role as well and how much she uh, gives into it uh, how much she seems to be enjoying the championship as well and a little bit about her uh, little comeback in 2016 for the Olympics and just how much the Olympic Games means to her and to this Montenegrin team. So first of all, from the little I've seen of, uh, of you interacting with the players and during the matches, you seem very, very happy. You seem to really be enjoying this championship and everything happening. Uh, how would you describe your, your feelings of the championship as a whole? Yes, I think that um, I need to be there for them and to support them and to give them energy. So I actually leaving the game like they are on the court. I am out of the court and I know how it's important that they have this uh, good feeling, uh, that they have a feeling that I, I'm there for them. And then uh, with good energy, I'm, for sure, I'm sure that uh, they will feel this and then uh, they will be much better if coach is uh, on the same side and uh, help them all the way. So... My mission is uh, to to prepare the game and on the game to be uh, big support for them uh, so they can feel that uh, I'm there for them. So uh, I did it when I was player. Now it's it's uh, much more difficult to be out of the court and uh, to do something on the court. But out of the court, you need to just to to be uh, with the good energy and with good idea to to give it them in the difficult time when they have and then they can feel much much comfortable on the court. I think so this is my job and I enjoy this and I think um, if I am like this I can uh, uh, live more the game like I can be more part of the game so for me it's naturally I, it's just coming you know natural yeah yeah, yeah. and the, a lot of people uh, I think are surprised with once again how you've managed to rejuvenate this team to, to compete at this level I mean this Montenegrin team always seems to be uh, in a phase of transition big players are leaving every couple of years Yolanka is a huge example of that um, and I think people begin to doubt whether this Montenegrin team can keep producing over and over again but you do yeah, it's a really difficult job to to in Montenegro to when we change uh, the players like we did last uh, from last year, European Championship we changed the four players and everybody didn't expect that we can uh, grow up uh, fast but uh, I I think that they're just uh, enjoying the, this tournament and they uh, want to 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 try to to improve and to show that they are new generation and they want to to be better and better and uh, they make uh, one good uh, connection between them and um, together with the staff and then um, they are growing up together they are really looking like a team and they enjoy together on the court this is most important this is my job to put them in this situation that they believe and they enjoy so when generation is changing for Montenegro it's very difficult job because of the there's not so many players on the court so when we make the court list for the long court list for the European Championship or European Championship 
it's very difficult to find those 35. You know, for example, on the last list, it was on my list was seven goalkeepers from the junior team, from the U17 team. I should put those uh, goalkeepers because I didn't have so many players to put. So. When you lose the key players, uh, those new who need to be key players need to learn to be key players. And those tournaments can learn them. Uh, they need to catch this situation and they need to be open for, for learning. Okay, some games is going down, some games is going up, but uh, if they learn from the game before, then they can just grow up during the tournaments and for the next tournament, of course, they will be more experienced players. So if you don't give them chance, they will never grow up. So it's difficult, of course. Uh, it can be like last World Championship in uh, Spain. We were 22, and next year when we were healthy, everybody and all players were ready, in uh, Montenegro we, were, we t- took the bronze. So up and down it's coming because of this small change in injury situation. If you have two key injured players, uh, uh, it's very difficult to find new for this position. So sometimes it's working, sometimes it doesn't work. But right now, those girls who is here, they are really want to play like a team. And this is most important. We don't have so many stars, but if you see the, in the eyes that they are enjoyed together, then you you actually want something, you know. Is there anything about this team or any particular players in the team that have surprised you at this championship? No, I just uh, want to all of them that uh, they are playing better, 10% if it is possible, and they were, so we are happy. So uh, those who is know each other a little bit better, okay, they can make good uh, cooperation faster during the tournaments. But when I see the some players who was not in Buducha, for example, where we are building something, they are falling in the team fast, then it's 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 good. So um, uh, Marta was very, very good on the goal uh, on the, those four games. And then s- s- hap- <laughs> this is sport, something happened when you don't expect. And then you need to, again, think positive and find a way to go to the next situation. She will be okay, of course, it's happened, so we, we cannot cry so much, we need to be positive and, and try to push other goalkeepers to be on the good level. She was actually maybe her best four games in the national team, Montenegro national teams, and I can say at, uh, uh, maybe at, it's Marta who, who surprised me, not surprised me, but she, she really came with a good energy and good uh, uh, form. And Marina has come in and done a fantastic job, uh, Rajic covering for her. Yeah. After the injury, yes. so uh, that's that's something positive yeah. to take from that as well. At this championship, uh, you know, one defeat, which uh, was you know could always happen against Croatia, was the exact scoreline from the test match before. As much as that means anything, these test matches, but uh, one defeat, and then all of a sudden, it's uh, it's not exactly in your hands getting into the the quarterfinals. But uh, you've got a big game against Sweden coming up. What do you think of? Of them because it feels like they've only really been tested now in the last uh, the last match. When we start the tournament, we start game by the game. We couldn't think so much in front, yeah. so we played and enjoy in every game to try to win, to give everything. And in the last game uh, with the Senegal, we get the chance to to uh, to play a little bit with the whole team in the, yeah. on the court because of the result in the first half. So actually. Uh, on this way we prepare for this last game with the Sweden to get people rest who get most uh, time on the court so now we just think about the Sweden not about the, any calculation what will happen before our game because it's stupid because you need to play the game and you need to try to, to do your best uh, it doesn't matter what will happen before so I expect a very difficult game because Sweden play on the home court I like uh, the full uh, hall uh, this is uh, very good for the player to feel this uh, situation and um, <clears throat> I'm also happy when I can play in front of the Orions you know empty hall it's, it's boring so I think that my players will be more motivated because of the full house like you say in the <laughs> Sweden and then um, Swedish hall they play tough in the defense of course they always did it we had some games preparing games before world championship in, uh, before the Spain in the Sweden so we have this experience, last experiences from this period. Uh, and uh, we have now material what they play in the last games. So we will for sure make um, some good analysis and prepare everything what we can. And you uh, mentioned there the, the work you're doing with Budućnost as well and trying to, to build something there. Um, with the, the few players that are playing in Montenegro at the moment, is it a case of kind of 
keeping a, a constant contact with every single player almost in Montenegro, whether they play for Borussia or not, because it feels like with the pool you have, if you're thinking of you know 30, 40, 50 players in total uh, to choose from, do you have a contact with all of them all the time? Do you try to bring them into training uh, even when they're you know not necessarily national team training? No, we don't have time for this because they are playing the Champions League clubs. So time for the national team is always when it's IHF uh, week. So we are using only this time like all other uh, national teams. But we know from the times before we trained together when they was young and they was in Buduchos. Now they are out to play on the, on the other clubs. But um, my job is uh, to to build up those players who is in the Buduchos, young player, and uh, to involve them to be better. Uh, during the Champions League to, ta- to this time when they are, will be in the national team. So uh, uh, Budućnost is always close connected with the national teams, any team, and people and players know each other actually because we are growing up together and then it's easier to make connection when they are coming to the national team. But uh, my goal is now to, to bring back as much as possible uh, national players home again. And then we can build up something during the Champions League in Budućnost, like we did to 2012. The team was almost all team national team was in Budućnost, and only like this we can do something big because it's difficult when we are not together because we are not so many. And then when we are together, we are take care so much about many things. Uh, about the injury and everything, and then uh, we don't have so many games. And then when national team is coming, they are fresh for play this uh, this tournament because when they are out, they play are playing so many games, and some of them are not not went for this, and they get injury, and then it's problem. So my goal is to get so much as possible players back in Budućnost in the next uh, period. Then we can maybe do a little bit better job with the national teams in the future. That's interesting. And you mentioned 2012 there and of course uh, fantastic success that not just club but also country and I think any handball fan who knows anything about Montenegro knows how important the Olympic cycles are for this team and uh, of course the Olympics is coming up very shortly. This also plays a big part in with this world championship and trying to get qualification places. How do you think this, this team is set up potentially for the Olympics in comparison to the last two uh, games? We will see. I, I think that uh, we have some course for the Olympic qualification uh, because we were number three yeah. in the European Championship. And now if we come to the quarter final, actually we are on this tournament. So uh, it's very important that those girls who is here get uh, so many games as is possible on this tournament. So if we go in the quarter final, we will actually have minimum three more. And uh, those uh, experience they will get in those three games, it's very important to grow up for something what will happen in the future. So every game for young generation who is changing, it's very important. It doesn't matter you win or lose, small or big. Everything can give some information and some experience to those girls. So we're just fighting now for the next game to, to be on the good level and to see what will happen and then to, to make the plan plans for the for the other things will come. Yeah. Um, it doesn't feel so long ago, 2016, when uh, you jumped back into to action for Montenegro as well. And uh, I think this, you know, the current generation shows how far the team has progressed since then. Um, can you give us a bit of insight into your short comeback for that Olympics and and what what sparked it yeah, for you? It was just uh, it was just uh, to be there to help them, like uh, some players who was. Um, Experience, you know, not to have some role like I had before. Of course, uh, my role should be just to push them in the situation when they are having bad period, to speak with them, to control some maybe attack situation when they are falling down. So, so it was a small role I should I should have. So actually, it was not uh, really come back. It was just for this uh, one month to to maybe they put them in situation that they feel feeling a little bit safe, more like I'm there and they can a little bit more have this self-confidence on the higher level nothing else it's very humble of you to say a small comeback for the Olympics it's not, it's yeah. not coming back for yeah. you know uh, yeah. nothing right yeah. but um, I, I guess you you take a little bit of that into your coaching as well it really feels like you as you said at the beginning you're you're there for them you live yeah. the moments as well uh, in training are you still able to throw a few balls around to, to show them what to do I don't take so much uh, during the training uh, balls because um, it's you need to control everything on the court, you know, so so it's difficult to train with them. But um, 
when I get uh, uh, angry, uh, when they don't understand some situation, uh, and I am a little bit like I see so many things on the court, and they are a little, how I can say, not every player can see what I can see, and then I, I know that they can see everything, but sometimes easy if you have two things, say you need to see those two, not three, four, five, and then if I explain and they don't see the situation opportunity and I am angry and I, then I start to take the ball and show and I just try to be myself from the time I, when I was player and then of course next day I get a pain in the knee because I try to make <laughs> and show how they should do this finta or they should do this jump shoot so not so often I, I when I get this ball in the hand I have this good feeling and then uh, it's not good because then you are sad because you cannot play anymore so I don't touch ball so much I think it's fantastic that uh, a star player like yourself is also coaching a national team like this. I think it's clearly inspirational for your players and also for the handball world. It's something I think we we need a lot more of. <laughs> and uh, and you said to me before that you don't you think ten or fifteen minutes is too much. Yeah. You've done fourteen already. <laughs> You've been fantastic. Thank you. So thank, much you thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Thank you to Bojana Popovic and what I mentioned at the end there about the the length of the interview, I spoke to her just before we started and she was a little bit nervous about doing, you know, 10 to 15 minutes uh, in English during a championship. She was like, I'm not sure my head is in the right space. Uh, I'm not sure my English is good enough. And so I just said to her, okay, look, we'll start and we'll see where it goes. And then, as you heard yourself, once she started, she was unstoppable. She was just uh, firing away there. Some great insight from uh, a coach like that. And it's great to have a, a real star of the game transition into being a coach. But it's all up in the air in that group. Uh, and the match is happening tonight uh, between Sweden and Montenegro and Croatia and Hungary, uh, with Montenegro and Croatia still battling it out for that second place, or potentially Montenegro getting top place in the group. And uh, we'll see the same over in Group 3 with Germany facing Denmark for a top spot. But that's all to come. I don't think we'd get away with not mentioning Patreon, Brian, because Alex isn't here. Usually he's the uh, on Patreon patrol to make sure that we're, we're mentioning that. This podcast is available for all people, but we'll have uh, probably the next podcast, the quarterfinal preview, will be uh, an exclusive one for the the Patreon fans. And uh, we had a bunch of people join as well in the past few days since our last podcast. So I'll mention them as well once it loads up on my screen here. Talk to amongst yourselves. Give me a minute. But while it's loading there, it, w- it would be so typical, by the way, just to go back to what you're just saying there. Hungary are knocked out now. They'll they'll be flying on all cylinders and absolutely smash Croatia later today. Oh, that would, that be, would be the most Hungarian the thing mo- ever. The most Hungarian thing, oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, we've had a bunch of people uh, just in the last couple of days who have joined us on patreon.com forward slash handball hour. So thank you to Peter Benz, Frederick Brunt, Katrina Skogli, and thank you also to Lydia Bukor. So all of you have joined in the last few days and plenty of time for you all to join and uh, catch up on the bonus podcast we've had in the last couple of weeks and also some more to come this week and also next month with the men's EHF Euro. But I think we'll wrap it up, Brian. So thank you and thank you all for listening and see you in a couple of days for the quarterfinal preview.